Sewing Teacher Cece. So I am doing Halloween costumes for the month of October. This is a kimono cosplay. This was the most expensive in terms of materials. This was about $75 in materials with things being on sale and coupons at Joann's. However, you can get it lower because it's not like I got everything for 50% off or more at Joann's. So this is a four-piece costume. There is the top, which has interfacing on the sleeves and the neckline. There is, there was supposed to be trim on these contrast bands as well, but I opted out of that because I felt like it would make this entire outfit too busy. And then I, there's a waist cincher. The waist cincher has boning, bias tape, and appliques on the front, and then grommets on the back, which you can't see because the four piece is a bow. The bow is on a large hook and eye so that it can slide on instead of it being a Velcro to this waist center only piece because I don't like things just being for one project. So I feel like I can go out and wear this skirt. Speaking of the skirt, this is the last piece. It was a lot of heritage and a lot of a bit of a learning curve. Uh, hi stranger, I know you want to go for a walk. Um, so this has horse braid on the um, hem as well as lace. And the horse braid acts as a stiffener on the edge to make it floofy. And so I really do like this. Um, the awesome thing about this project is that you can make it longer. You can make it shorter. Um, like right now, the waistband of the skirt is right here underneath the waist center. I could have it higher, lower. Like it kind of depends on where I want this waist center. Hi, do you want picked up? Do you want picked up? Ranger wants to go on a walk so bad. So if you like this project and you want to learn more, continue watching. Bye! We are going to make a cosplay! Okay, I'm super excited about this project because kimono cosplays, so much fun. I bought this pattern a long time ago and I am super excited to get into it. I am making A with modifications, so just to keep an eye on kind of what I'm doing. So. This is the gorgeous cotton that I found at Joann's. Um, I'm just using this because it's gorgeous. It fits the theme and, I mean, who doesn't want to use it? <laughs> so, this is supposed to have a center back seam, which for regular kimonos is usual. However, they're cut from a very narrow pre-made bolt. It's cotton. <laughs> I don't have a narrow bolt to work with, and I don't particularly want to make a seam that isn't necessary. So, um, everything is going to be trimmed in black. I know everyone is going to eventually get upset at me for all the black. Um, so the neck pieces do still have that center seam, um, but I'm not too worried about it, because I can always just cut and make a center seam with my serger later. Half of all the trim pieces are interfaced. I used fusible interfacing on all except one, and I will get into that one later. So this is the back, which has your neck, the start of your sleeve, I'm going to move it to the side. Then you have your front pieces. These cross over the body, so they don't have a scooping neck right here, they just have the shoulder seam. You've got your sleeve portion down. And then off the camera is a triangular shape that goes all the way over. So this is actually going to be lots of fun to do because of the fact that it is so massive. It is just going to be a lot of fun. Um, again, it's going to be trimmed like that. But the best part of this is with that black trim. I'm actually going to make this look even nicer. I'm going to pull this back. Put this on. Is that... With A, it recommends trims. So I could put this on like this, but I am thinking about more putting it on like this as a transitional piece. And so you've got that little bit of Lolita-esque um, element to it. This is just the trim for the top. I also have lace for the skirt, but we'll get into that. So that is the kimono top top. It's not 100% accurate, but it's also not wrong. 
Um, it does have a lot of the basic elements of the kimono. It will have ties on the sides so that when it overlaps, you tie it here and you tie it here so that um, it stays more in place. So I'm gonna move this out of the way. I have various tiles off screen. Okay. This is a sleeve, which is just basically a giant rectangle where, there we go, where this portion is actually where your arm goes through. Um, when, it'll be, make a lot more sense in construction. This will also have interfacing or er, interface bands on this side. However, when you're doing a lot of interfacing at once and one of your pieces falls, you have one piece that has fusible interfacing and then one that you're going to show everybody how to use sew-in interfacing because you ran out and these pieces are super long. I didn't want to just go buy interfacing um, that I would need two yards of just to get the appropriate length for this, which is okay. Um, sew-in interfacing I already had and it's a lot of fun to do. Again, this will have the trim to make it all nice and gorgeous. So that is the top. Let's move on to the next piece. This has a lot of distinct pieces going on. Like a lot of distinct pieces. Okay. So back. So you also have a ruffle skirt. So this skirt is also going to have a horse braid, which I have never worked with, on the edges of each ruffle. Which I think is actually going to be fun because it's going to make everything kind of stick out a little bit more. So you're going to have your top ruffle and bottom ruffle in this gorgeous fabric. But to break it up, because I didn't want all the layers to kind of blend together, the middle tier is actually going to be black. Um, and I feel like that blends everything together. Then that gets into this portion. So your waistband casing on the top is going to flow into your top tier of your skirt. And so it's in this color. Your next tier of your skirt is going to blend into this black. And then the last one, which is going to have that last ruffle on it, is going to be this one. So you're gonna have it blend like this but on top of that, we're also going to have lace on each layer. So we're going to, here, let me do this a little bit better. So we're going to have lace and horsehair on each layer. And I picked a longer, similar colored lace with a similar pattern for the bottom, just to add couple more pretend inches to that really short skirt because the sh sleeves are actually supposed to be longer than this skirt. So that is roughly what the skirt is going to look like. It is supposed to be Velcro on and Velcro off. I'm not a fan of that, so I'm probably going to put it on a clip so that you can clip it on and off your outfit, because I feel like having unused Velcro on your waist cincher is a bit of a waste, so I'm going to modify how this is constructed. So this is the loops, the knot, and then each of the bow strands. The bow strands are supposed to just be sewn kind of willy-nilly onto the knot. I'm probably going to play with that a little bit because I feel like the more uniform it looks, the longer it'll last. Because I want this outfit to last more than one Halloween. Because what's the point in making all of this work and then not have it last? Okay. Waist. I know, I'm waist center. Okay, so this is supposed to be our pretend Obi. I am going to make a layer, like both sides are going to be black. I am going to go ahead and make a green layer 
to kind of show off how this is supposed to go. Um, all of it is interfaced with mid-weight. Um, I could have used um, thicker, but I wasn't going to. This is the boning that I picked up. And I have boning caps for this, so I'm going to go ahead and use those. Because, why not? Because I think I got them for free, actually, even though they're labeled for 50 cents as one of those. If you bought something at Joann's, please take this. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and use those boning caps, because it's actually made for this bo flexi curve boning. Um, so the center of the OB is going to go ahead and have these appliques, which I'm super excited about, which I'm going to have to stitch on. Um, and aren't they just gorgeous? And then it's going to be trimmed in gold, which actually matches the metallic gold that's on the cotton for the rest of the kimono. So that's everything. Um, I also have horse braid, which I didn't show, which is for the skirt. I've never used horse braid before. It's going to be interesting. Um, I've made ruffles again and again. And I'm going to wonder if it's going to change how I make ruffles in the future. So for this pattern, I was originally going to actually make this one out of cotton, um, but nowhere in the store did they have enough yardage for me to have enough fabric to also make that over skirt. So I gave up on that. Um, I went ahead and chose this one because I had just enough yardage to, uh, of that fabric that I picked to do it. Um, I am really excited about this. It is the most expensive costumes with all of, with a bunch of different trims and appliques on it. So this costume that I picked, even though it's made out of cotton, which makes it a lot cheaper, it is also going to be a little more spendy because of the fact that it is so much yardage, so many notions, so many trims. But I think with coupons and sales, I only paid about 70 for this entire outfit, which is not bad considering how much you can pay for just a regular outfit for Halloween. So I am really excited to do this. Um, and I hope that you kind of like this kimono cosplay that we're going to jump into. So I actually have a clip on mic because I wanted to make my, or my editor's life easier. I'm also going to change up the format of this. I'm not going to have you guys watch me sew. Because um, these are straight seams. If you watch any of my other apparel videos, you'll know how to do this. So what I'm doing with each of these layers right now is that I'm going to serge, but you can also French hem or regular sew every layer so that it makes a complete circle. Um... And I'm just going to go ahead and do that off camera. And then for each ruffle layer, I'm going to take it to the sewing machine. And I'm going to do a basting hem on what I want to be the top half of my layers. So I'm going to go ahead and run and do that. And then show you each layer as I gather it and sew it. So everything's been run through the serger. It is now a complete circle. So this is the waistband. And... It is a complete circle. Careful not to twist it because otherwise you are not going to be able to assemble this correctly. Um, we're not looking for Mobius here. Um, so the next portion is that these, which are the layers, are going to go to the side. I'm going to baste the top of each of these, and it has to be the top because that's what's connecting to the ruffle itself. So I'm going to baste the top of these. Granted, this is the black, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and then I'm going to, or so I'm going to gather and I'm going to show how to assemble each step. All right. So the pattern would say you need to stay stitch here and here. Not doing that. This is cotton. It's pre shrunk. No worries. Um, there is also supposed to be a center back seam here to be authentic for kimonos and how narrow their bolts are. However, I didn't do that because I don't see the point in breaking up this beautiful fabric to go and do that. Um, so I am going to be doing this shoulder seam right here. Make sure that you have your kimono fronts doing this in the front when you go ahead and sew this. Remember, right sides together. <laughs> shoulder seam is done. So this is the front and this is the back. If you, your sleeves are rectangles. So in order to figure out how you want the front and back facing, you need to for, flip this over so that your front is showing. Okay. And then fold your sleeve in half and figure out which way you want towards the front and which way you want towards the back. 
So I want it towards the front like this so the fans are going towards the shoulder this way, which means that I'm going, and it could be that I need to flip it over like this, except then the center fans are going that way. Um, so you need to figure out which way it needs to go before you pin it. So I have it folded in half, okay? This is the direction I want it to go in. So I'm going to unfold the shoulder and then I'm going to go ahead and pin it so that this center shoulder seam matches where this fold is, but that the front is having the pattern go in the direction that I want to go. So I'm going to go ahead and sew, pin and sew this. Hi Jarvis. And then you can make sure that your kimono sleeves are going the direction you want them to go in. So the sleeve is attached. Huge thing about this. You may have a little bit of overlap and that is okay when you sewed the seam because that's going to be right where your armpit is. So you're going to be able to correct that on this next seam and nobody's going to be able to tell. Okay, so for this, you're going to fold the sleeve in half, match all the corners on the bottom of the sleeve, match, basically you're going to sew the bottom of the sleeve here, let me go to the half that I pinned. Okay, so you're going to sew the bottom half of the sleeve, leaving the arm or the sleeve opening open. You're going to sew up the sleeve towards the um, armpit, sew the armpit, and then you're going to sew the sides of the top. Huge thing, do not forget to do the ties. So because this goes left over right, Um, there, basically on the right front, you need to have a tie and on the left wrong side, you need to have a tie. So basically one of the right side should have this sandwiched in between the layers. The other side should have this, um, on the outside of the layers. The reason why is because you'll tie on either side of your waist, the, um, yeah, it's left over, right? Um, you're going to tie the um, top, um, and that's going to secure it a lot more because your waist cincher, if you want to choose to do something else at your waist, it'll make sure that it doesn't, like, come open or wiggle open. And so this is the first two of the ties. The other two ties are going to go right where the um, neckline band is, so don't worry too much on that part. Um, so remember that on the right side of on the right side of the fabric, on the right side front panel, or on the right. <sighs> okay. Put this on a person. Sew with a buddy. On the wrong side of the left front panel, put a tie, which is this one. On the right front panel, on the right side of the fabric, put another tie. And make sure they're about the same length from the bottom. Um, and it just needs to be approximately kind of where the top of your, um, this piece goes. Because this piece is where it's going to come around and have another tie and tie right here. Okay. Tongue twisters. Can't do them all day. So I've sewn the, um, seams. And I'm pretty happy with how it turned out when I put it on. Um, I also learned a new technique in, um, because I'm not using my serger, I'm actually using a friend's serger and figuring it out so I could teach her. I figured out how to turn this corner, so you finish this corner, turn the serger, and then keep going down, um, and you pull on the threads when you turn it so it doesn't have too much slack, and it makes it so that we have a nice crisp point on our kimono sleeve. So I am pretty thrilled about that. Of course, I haven't pressed these seams that's my huge. Um, <laughs> so, so the sleeves are on, the sides of the uh, fabric is on, and it is left over right, which is why the left side has this inner string to tie. I do need to either use some sort of technique to make this so that it doesn't fray. Um, however, so here's the dilemma I'm at. So it wants a narrow hem on this portion of the front and then all the way around the bottom edge 
However, I don't have my serger set up for a ruled hem yet, and I prefer to do the least amount of changes as possible during a project because sergers are not the most fun to switch back and forth on. So my idea is to do the sleeves first, do the rolled hem on this and the ruffle skirt at the same time, and then um, do the neckband entirely on the sewing machine instead of the serger. So I'm going to do the sleeves next, which is not what the directions want me to do. Um, so the sleeves have two bands that are not interfaced and then two bands that are. And I explained this earlier that I have one that is so in interfacing and the other one that is fused. So I'm going to start with the um, fusible. I'm going to sew this in a circle, so I'm going to have to turn this around and sew like into a band, which matches the width of this sleeve opening, which surprisingly is not quite the same as what this band is. So I'm going to have to trim this band a little bit because you can see that there's quite a bit of excess right here, which is great because I'd rather um, have too much material than not enough. So I'm going to go ahead and make the bands match, and then I'm going to sew them on with the serger. Um, and then I will show you how that looks, and then I'll move on to the next step. An example of how I make sure that the sleeves match each layer. So I pinned all the way around, and then I marked where each of these two ends meet the center. And I didn't pin that, and then I'll sew down this line and cut off the excess. So the major reason I did it like this is the same way that I do it for bias tape. So it's a very familiar method. Um, so I'll go ahead and sew that, but that's how I'm going to do to make each of these uh, contrast bands to make sure they match. Okay, so sew one interfacing sleeve band is on. Matching seems the best I can. I am not a quilter, but it is very, very close. Um, as long as every portion of a sew-in interfacing is sewn, you don't need to worry about it. Um, and then, of course, you do the same process for the non-interface uh, sleeve band, which I've already done on this one. All the strings. Um, interesting thing about woven fabrics is you can cut it and then rip it to get completely straight grain lines. Um, so this is already done. This was the fusible interfacing, which won't move when I try to move the two layers. Um, or at least shouldn't if you put it on correctly. Um, and so the next portion of this is to press this seam open. I know it's black, so all the sunlight over there though press the seam open and top stitch it and then to also press and fold this over onto the other band um, and then sew that in place. So I'm going to go ahead and do those next two or I'll finish the other sleeve band, do the next two steps and then show you where I'm at because then at that point I can actually put trim on. So invest in good tools. That is the first thing I'm going to say. Invest in good tools. Because the better your tools are, the happier you are going to be with what you make. Um, I got a very cheap serger. You've seen my brother. It does not do this. It does not switch between a seam like this to a rolled hem in less than two minutes. Sam, the librarian, who also is the much appreciated editor of my videos, bought it serger and asked me to kind of help teach her how to use it. And I told her the best way I could do that was for me to figure out how it worked. I'm so jealous of this machine. Um, I'll go ahead and slide it into the frame real quick. Oh, this is heavy, which is also how you know it's a good machine. Um, it is an Eclipse baby lock. It is a very old baby lock. It works fantastically better than my brother. If you're going to sew, you're going to get frustrated by inferior tools. So invest in good tools if you're going to do this a lot. 
Um, and I know that makes that a very, this is a very expensive hobby. But if you find a good sewing, like a local sewing shop that does repairs and does repairs on machines that aren't ones that they sell, then you're going, it's like buying a used car. <laughs> you have to, if you're going to buy machinery, you have to trust who you're buying it from. So this took less than two minutes to set up, which with my brother would have taken like 10 or 20, which is why I do all rolled hems at the same time and all seams at the same time. So um, this just looks so good. Ugh, I can't get over how well these seams look. Um, cause I know you guys have seen some wonky seams from my machine. Um, so this is ready to go. Funny story. I have a kitten. If y'all have been watching my videos, you know I have a kitten. This noise does not cause immediate concern with my kitten. Why? Because I give him shipping paper from packages. Jarvis had paper in the living room where there was no shipping paper. So I look over to where all his toys are. And what has he stolen from my table? My directions. What has he caused holes and such damage to? My directions. So, and he's looking so innocent in his cat tree, which is like, if I point upwards, the sun's not going to let you see the black cat. Um, but he pretends to be so innocent. Look at that face. Look at that face. That is the face of eating my paper. You're cute. I love you. Play with your toys. Not with my stuff. Please. On aside, if anyone's noticed, I actually sound better in these videos. I invested in a clip-in mic that goes to my smartphone. So you have way less of me breathing on the camera to try and be heard. And hopefully, if I have to wear a mask for my intro, I'm not sure at this point where I'm going to do that. Well, yep, there he goes. Um, then you'll be able to better hear me. So there was a little bit of slack um, when I pinned the interface neckband. I left this much extra room on each end, pinned the center back little bit of gapping but not too much because like if I pull on this fabric a little bit it lays pretty well um so it's actually gonna lay pretty nicely after I sew it so this is the neckband um I'm gonna go ahead and sew this and then sew the black uninterface part to here and then I'll be ready to just move to the sewing machine so I roll hemmed, I went ahead and just rolled hemmed this skirt. So this is not how you typically put on horse braid. However, um, the way that you put on horse braid makes a really bulky hem, and you know how I feel about bulky hems on ruffles. So horse braid is a stiffener that is actually supposed to help um, your uh, project look really nice. So typically you would go on the right side of the fabric, sew it on the bottom, flip it all the way in, which would make a nice hem. However, that makes a bulky hem, don't care for it. So instead, I've already rolled hemmed, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and fold up, put my horse braid in, and just sew. Now, horse braid does not like having its ends exposed. So I'm actually going to take advantage of this seam, sew it down, and then start which is going to make this end of my horse braid stay uh, pretty covered. Um, and then when I get to the end, I'm going to use a small piece of fabric um, and just actually what I'm going to do, I'm going to leave that part in, go all the way around, but I'm not going to start all the way at the end where the seam is. And then when I get to the end, I'm going to go around, go around, tuck this in sew it up and down because then it has a fabric that is holding it in place and it looks pretty decent um and I don't have any more bulkiness adding to each ruffle so again I'm gonna tuck it in like this fold it up sew on the seam you don't actually have to sew the top of this which is pretty cool um and it's just meant to add a stiffness layer so that it poofs out more 
without like you know anything underneath it holding it up in that position so i'm gonna go ahead and the machine do that to all of the ruffles and then i'm gonna actually throw the lace on so i'll show you what it looks like when i'm done with at least the horse braid and then what it looks like with the lace horse braid so because of the fact that you don't want this to be too abrasive is you overlap it put a scrap piece of fabric under it so much fabric um so the horse braid So you sew the scrap of fabric to the horse braid to make it into a loop without it being able to be abrasive to itself. Okay. And then... It'd be helpful if I could see what I was doing. This is why I have switched modes of how I'm sewing mostly so I can see what I'm doing. Um, so lift this up, trim excess threads and the excess fabric. Okay. So most of this is still pinned. So you want to be careful not to stretch the horse braid but stick it in there and in place um it's almost like a join that you need okay so I'm going to pin this rigorously um because that fabric that i sewed on is not cooperating to its fullest um so when i sew this I am, I have it already folded over to the seam allowance that I want, and all I'm going to do is sew in a circle. So I'm not going to show that whole process because this is the longest of the layers, so I will show you when all of them are done. These are the skirts with the horse braid, um, or at least the skirt ruffle layers. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to sew the lace on. Instead of having the lace coming up from underneath, I'm going to sew it on top, and that's also going to hide the thread that I sewed the horse braid on with, as well as reinforce the horse braid being on. So I'm going to have a short, short, short and long, or just a long lace. We'll see when we get there. It will not match the lace that's on the kimono top, which I'm not worried about. Lace is now on the hems. Um... So I've got one layer of lace on the top layer, the middle layer, and then the bottom layer, I have that longer lace with the smaller lace. So it's a lot less, it adds like two inches to the whole skirt and just makes it extra poofy on the bottom, which I absolutely love. So the next thing I'm going to do is, is uh, gather the basting on this layer, this bottom layer, and pin it to the um skirt layer and then serge that together so i gathered and sewed this first ruffle and this is the bottom this is the back seam that you can see um so i decided to put this in the center back of the skirt and so i gathered it and i put the gather on top so that the bottom was flat and sewed that together so i already have this next layer pinned so how this layer will go is that the ruffle will be sandwiched between the layer, the top of the layer that I just sewed and the skirt of the next one. So I can figure out where seams are. So I'm going to repin this and put this inside this and that is the next part. The layer is sewn on. I'm going to go ahead and do the waistband, which is right here with elastic in it already. This was folded over and just base stitched so it'll stay together. And then the top layer. 
And the horse hair is what's giving this this entire extra flu factor. So this is really interesting. But the thing is, is that it also pops out like that a lot. So I have to constantly remember to flip it back over. So one more layer and this skirt is done. Done. And as you can tell, the horse hair still makes it super floofy. Um, so it is actually a very decent length, um, which I wasn't thinking it was going to be to begin with. But then again, I don't have long legs like my sisters. So this is how to make the skirt portion, um, including horse hair and lace. Um, and oh, it's just so darling. I really like that I broke this up so that it doesn't have all this, as lovely as this fabric is. I also love that I continued the pattern. Yeah, so next portion. For a discount, a buddy that'll sew with you. <laughs> My husband pressed these seams for me because he knows how much I absolutely love slash hate ironing. And so he pressed these seams so that it's folded in on the inside and so I can just sew it on this side. Um, he said that this looks just fine without a trim. In fact, he's also not a big fan of the trim I ended up picking up for the top. So I'm going to go with his idea and just leave this as is because I feel like this will also make it a lot more versatile, whereas there's lace on the skirt. So, and plus the late, the trim that I picked for the top doesn't really match the bottom. So I'm going with his idea and skipping it. Um, cause I also feel like it lets this top really shine. Whereas the skirt with the ruffles really doesn't show off the beautiful fabric. So that's what I'm doing. So when you sew it, then you've got this beautiful um, border and it just like I sewed on the top but I ironed on the bottom first <laughs> um, and then I just followed the edge of the foot on this already pressed seam right here and so that's what I am doing for the sleeves so with the top so we're not doing trim <laughs> throwing that out there um, so we ended up not going with the white trim that I picked up um, I also did free check the ends of the ribbons. So the ribbon, the other two of the four ribbons need to go on the ends of this neck band. Um, this neck band is already pressed. Thank you, my amazing husband. Um, pressed so that it will just need to go around the entire thing and it's done. Um, and that's where I'm at with the top. Um, I really do like how it looks where this, the top showcases the fabric, which is just absolutely stunning, um, without the busyness of a trim on top, whereas the lace on the bottom really makes, doesn't, the, the ruffling on the bottom just doesn't make this pattern look and pop as beautifully as the top does. Um, the waist center is going to have an applique on it, and it's going to have a metallic gold bias tape, so I feel like it'll be, the top is showcasing the fabric, you have the break of the waist cincher, and then the ruffle skirt will be um, kind of like your Lolita costume portion. So this is the bow. So the bow's pieces are all interfaced, and I used a midweight. So for the next step, each of the ends need to be folded in half, sewn from the corner up, and then clip the corners. And that'll be for these two pieces. Uh, knot needs to be folded in half hot dog style and sewn. And then this piece, which is the bow itself, needs to be folded hot dog style and sewn. Um, I'm going to cheat a tiny bit. Um, and I might fold in the ends on this side so that I can just slide it in when I need to do the bow in the center. And that'll make it just laid neat, a little more neatly. Um, and then same thing with the bow. Because it'll make it look nicer when I stitch it next. If the top is already folded inward. Um, to go ahead and assemble everything. Because the um, black pieces are both interfaced on both sides. I'm just going to go ahead and just, instead of using the green as an example. Because you can see everything on the white. Um, I'm going to go ahead and throw these together. 
So when you look at the corset pa or pieces for this, this is the center. Like, everything comes out this way. This center is supposed to replace the OB, which is why it's curved so much on the front. It's to mimic that. Um, and then 12 goes to 13. But 13 does not go to 14. It goes to 15. And you can tell because they're on the pattern itself for little guide darts. So this matches this. This little triangle needs to go to the little triangle on this side. And then the double darts, which are on this side, need to go to here. And then this will be flat for the end. And so I'm going to sew both sets together and then go ahead and then I'll show you what that looks like and how we're going to do the bowing. These are, so this is the knot. I went ahead and flipped over and sewed this and then sewed the seam and clipped corners. I did the same thing on the bow itself. These you just sew at the angle, clip here and here and turn right side out. I'm going to go ahead and press these and show you what that looks like. So each waist cincher is already done. Um, it looks wonky now because I need to iron it and it's going to look wonky because there's still seam allowance that needs to be evened out. Um, which I'm not too worried about because like it'll, it's meant to be curved when I'm done. So I clipped all of the seams. I'm going to go take it to the iron and press so that it's not laying flat as much as it's laying how it's supposed to. And then for boning, this is the boning I have. And this boning you is the ridge line. You can sew directly it directly to the uh, thing. So for each of these, I only need nine pieces. Three for the front, one here, one here, and then one right here. So, and then I've got, I don't have enough black, but I have black and white. So I'm going to go ahead and do all of that for this center. Um, that sound was this one jumping on my table. <laughs> and there's a tail. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and measure and cut and put on those, or the caps for that, so that you can see what it looks like when that's ready. So this is pressed, so it looks really nice and pretty. I just... They're both black, so I just decided that one was going to be the lining and the other is not. So, for this boning, it has a very, very tiny edge that you can sew on to sew it directly to the fabric. And I'm not going to film that because it's black and it's tiny and this camera is up, not even this good at focusing. There we go. So, you sew on this really tiny border to sew it on. And, of course, you backstitch every line. Um, you do not sew across the top. Um, I read the directions for the caps, and the caps are meant for if this is going to be against skin, which it is not, because it is going to be entirely enclosed. So I marked my placement lines, and pretty much the six that, so three on this side, three on the other side, six just need to be pretty much the same size. And I marked where the center of each panel is for these two, and then kept this the same on the other side. So I'm going to go ahead and tack those down um, to figure out this one. Because I could use the placement lines from the pattern, but if your seam allowance is slightly off, then your lines will be off. I folded this in half, matching the seams. Folded this in half to get this line. And then folded this space in half to get this line. And so this will be this front panel that sits against my stomach. And it should work pretty decently as is. Um... So I'm going to go ahead, sew everything together. Again, you just cut these and you sew on the really tiny border that is on the very edge of these. Um, that is more flexible than the rest of it. Um, and of course, I haven't cut these three pieces yet. Um, so that's how you do the boning on this. It is this. I would highly recommend this boning because it's a lot easier to do if you slow and steady, straight line. Remember to leave seam allowance on the top and the bottom for the bias tape that will finish this, and you're pretty set. Boning is done, and it took me a grand total of doing two of these to come up with a method that instead of having to restart on the other side, I would go um, 
back stitch right here all the way down back stitch go a little bit across without actually sewing the bottom of the boning back stitch here back stitch here makes it look very nice on the other side and it makes it so that it is so securely in there um all nine are in and so this one is ready to go now I promised an applique. So this is pinned within an inch of its life. I don't know if you can see how many colored pins are in there, but I promise there's quite a few. Um, <laughs> new, uh, new activity, guess how many pins are in here? So I pinned everything that has a point that might move. Um, typically people put on appliques when they're done with something, but in this situation, it's great to put it in before we're at that point. Hi, Ranger. Are you on my feet? Yes, you are. Do you want something? <laughs> anyway, um, so to do appliques, at least in this where it's not completely sewn, what you either want to do is hand stitch or very carefully machine, machine stitch all around these outer edges where this lace is not totally covered. I would recommend hand stitching, but if you're like me and on a time crunch and don't necessarily want to, be very, like, one reason I really am happy with the jubilance we have is the fact that they are speed controlled. If you were sewing in my class, you can have it go at a snail's place, snail's pace, or very, very quickly. So this you're going to want to go very slowly and outline every edge. So I'm going to do that on the lowest setting I can possibly do it on and make sure that this applique is down very firmly. Everything's pressed. Here are the bow tails, the knot, and I ironed it so that this seam is in the back in the center. And then this is all ready to go and so the next thing is is that tucking this raw edge into this finished edge of the bow and making a basting seam in the center and then pulling that tight and then doing basically the same thing with that in the center of the knot so I'm gonna go ahead baste this seam have the knot ready to go and then the bow tails will have to like finish this and kind of see how they look best. All right, so this is what we ended up with. When I basted it and tried to pull it like I would a ruffle, it didn't work. So I ended up pinching it and then wrapping it with thread and then putting the end of the knot into the finished end of the knot and then calling it good. Um, I haven't stitched this down yet. Um, so basically what I'm doing is just kind of going back and forth and stitching that for the moment. Okay. So then it becomes these. So these are supposed to be the bow ends and just trying to figure out how to artfully have them overlap and kind of look pretty because if I do it like that, they don't look quite natural. Well, nothing I do is going to make them look natural because they aren't pleated. So I'm going to try pleating them for the moment. I think that looks a little bit better. So I'm really going to pleat them, stitch them by hand, and then show you what I've done when I'm done. The applique took me about 30 minutes to sew on for all of it, and I did tiny zigzag stitches all the way around and so it's very securely on here when you go over sequence though be extra super careful and slow because the last thing you want is for your needle to break so this is done so what i need to do is line these up with right sides out like this except i think i have the other one flipped over the wrong direction and stay stitch the top and bottom of course, I'm going to stay stitch on this side so I can keep an eye that I don't run over any boning. And that is the next step. A very crucial step. You are going to have to first, with right sides together, sew right here. On just on this side of the boning. 
And the reason why is because this boning is supposed to be right where your grommets go, right here. And so if you want a smooth edge right here without having to use bias tape, just sew right along where that is. Is the cosplay world go round? Hot glue. Um, so when you have midweight interfacing and this many layers to hand sew, I tacked a few places and then went hot glue. Um, I also put an extra long, what is supposed to be an Isla and hook, just the hook on so that it will just hook to the back of the um, cincher or whatever because now I have made a versatile bow. Um, and I really do like how this bow turned out. Um, I just ended up using hot glue because I couldn't sew everything. So I had tacked down the top parts of these, tried to hand stitch them on, ended up hot gluing. So the bow is done. Okay, so now we have the bias tape. Um, this cincher is making me super happy um, with how well it turned out. So I'm going to trim a little bit and then attach bias tape. So typically you can sew bias tape on that line, flip it over and sew, secure it in the front. Um, you can also just try to sandwich it together and see if it'll stay. I prefer the method of um, work smarter, not harder. If I don't have to sew it twice, then I don't want to. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead, trim everything, sew on this first line, flip it over, and then tack it down on the front. And then I'm done. So this is done. Uh, this really makes me think of Mortal Kombat. Um, I didn't have any gold thread, so I went ahead and went with a black. Are the seams perfect? No. Did I have to fight very slippery metallic fabric? Yes. Um, so overall, I really like it. Um, I like how it turned out. It is very sturdy feeling. Um, so I feel like this would make a really good um, waist cincher for a lot of different things, especially if you just did it with black bias tape and with whatever applique you want on the front. And then just pair with a plain dress and it looks amazing. Alright, so I hope that was helpful. I am going to throw grommets on. Um, I say I, but it's really not going to be me. Um, it says three grommets, but depending on the size of your grommets, you might be able to fit four. Jervis for this video because he will get up on the table but Ranger has been a tripping hazard because my tripod is normally right off to the side and Jarvis just ran by and he has been constantly where my feet need to be <laughs> so if you like this video please like comment and subscribe